Today, I'm going to complete our first part of the discussion of the final project. Of course, as I promised, there will be other instances when I will ask you what progress you're making, if you have any questions, or I will highlight some details of the project. Most of today's class will be spent watching sequences, scenes from the first Otto 1927 film. There is a bad copy available on YouTube. And of course, it was there this morning. It might be removed tonight following an intervention by Warner Brothers lawyers. <clears throat> Um, and I will ask you to write a few notes either on your Google Docs file or the usual forms that I brought with me, okay? Keep in mind, the first part of my class on the project is based on a page, a specific page on the format and the methodology of the project and more specifically a new section that I created to help you to support your work on this. So take your time to revisit, to read the page, to think about it and come back with questions either in class or in my office. A reminder now that we're moving towards the end of the semester I'm available right after the class, between 3.30 or so, as soon as I go back to the office, and 5 every Tuesday and Thursday. I also have Zoom office hours early in the morning. However, you can also reach out to me for an appointment that in person takes place at another time, or same for Zoom. I was talking to one of the students at the end of Tuesday's class uh, and he was suggesting that I provide an example of a project from previous semesters. I, I thought about it and it's something that I uh, also had in mind, but given the amount of time we spent specifically using the story of the foam bloomers, I thought it would be better for me to provide a full-fledged example. And therefore, I, I spent half of the day yesterday adding this section, full example of a treatment of a short story. And when I finished, I added a few notes because I don't want you to think that this is the only model for the execution of the project. This is a good example, and this example was developed according to the qualities, the contents, the themes featured in the short story of, uh, the, the, of this couple that gets their first car. Depending on the material you're working on, you will have to make adjustments. So this in italics is one of the sections that I recommend you read after you've reviewed this project. Let me see if I can make this work. I'm still trying to understand how this keyboard works. So I used the template that you found on this page with its various section and for each section I provided <coughs> everything that would be appropriate. And again, keep in mind, I'm not one of you. I'm a professor. Of course, I tend to write more. I tend to have a more comprehensive treatment of a short story like this. But it works in a way because when you provide an example you try to make it the ideal example, and then it's something you aspire to when you adjust depending on your own competence, understanding of the material of the class, and 
the material, the, short, the story you would be working on. So the first section of the recommended template includes bibliographical references about the story. And for the story that we have examined last Thursday and this week, you find the title, the name of the author as it was reported in the publication, because the publication only says TM, and it didn't take me long to find the actual full name of the author, which I placed in square brackets to signify it's not reported there, but it's clear that it is this person. The, the direct way I arrived at this conclusion is that this couple, the Von Bloomers, are the same characters you find in several other stories by this author, even in a published format. Okay, then I added the name of the magazine, the exact date of the issue where the short story appeared, and the pages. One more requirement is the inclusion of a link, and you should make sure that this is the link that takes to the actual story, not at the beginning of the file. And if you have any if you need any assistance with that, uh, we can do a demo in class or I can do a demo with you via Zoom. But essentially, when you collect the link, make sure to click on it. Because when you go to a Google page, it changes depending on the browser or the platform, whether it's Mac OS or Windows, etc. But often, if you get the URL from the browser itself, that link might not take you back to the page where you are. The page you want to point at. You need to use the icon with the, with the chain links to collect the proper link from inside Google Books. Or if you are in AviTrust, which is an even better platform for these kinds of research, there are different links provided inside the interface of the digital archive rather than the URL on top, which, is, which works in that moment, but it's not a permanent pointer. Now, knowing the full name of the author, I was able to find some information about him, but notice that, in fact, there is a short bibliograph biographical entry in Wikipedia, I didn't need anything more than that. I could have used a, the primary source from which Wikipedia got the information, which was an encyclopedia from uh, the 1910s and 20s, if I had access to it, but I couldn't find it online. It's just a few lines, and I could have made it even shorter, right? It's not a display of erudition. It's just the bare minimum that one, the average reader, uh, could use to place the story in a context. Who wrote this, right? Is it a journalist? Is it a writer? Was it a famous writer? In this case, you have an editor who's also a writer, but who fashions himself an intellectual, someone who has this anthropological understanding of social phenomena such as the mania, the fever for the car. So just a few lines, and already this is probably excessive. But you might not know who the author is. Some of those stories were published anonymously. You might not be able to find that information about your author, right? Just make a good faith, limited effort to find relevant information. And as part of this section, I advised if the story, and it's easy to find out using key phrases in the story, if the story was republished, that is significant, right? 
if it was published several times on other magazines, because magazines were buying stories from each other, magazines in England were buying stories in the US and vice versa, that would mean something, that the story had traction with the audience, that was successful, that the story was trending with the readers. In this case, I found that the story was published by the author himself, together with other short stories he wrote in 1905, and I included, again, the simple information, the basic information. You see all the bibliographical references, details are in here, and I added a link, but this is optional. The important link is that one, right? So that I can uh, myself find the story when I review your project. I added the length for each section, but it doesn't mean that your project has to be the same length. Just to give you an idea, okay? Just for reference. The next section that you find in the project, the project's template, is the synopsis. And this is one of the most important. Because it may seem trivial to provide the summary of a story. But what I'm looking for is a synopsis, a summary that shows your understanding of the story and your understanding of the use we can make of a story where the automobile plays a crucial role. So, of course, I overdid it. I wrote a detailed summary with most of the details concerning what happens to the car, the reactions by the husband and the wife, uh, the role of the neighbor who's an enemy of the automobile, someone who hates automobiles. Notice also that I included some quick quotes. And then, of course, I added the page numbers, because sometimes adding the quotes in this context was better than using those quotes in the section about the quotes. And I'll explain that in a short while. Of course, depending on the story you're trying to process into this template for the project, you may have a story that has other episodes, other things going on that have little or nothing to do with the car, right? Not every story will have such a an absolute focus on the automobile like this one. So, again, you just want to include information that is relevant, information that would help a reader who is an average reader and not someone who's teaching this class or has taken this class, understand the terms of the representation of the automobile and ownership of the automobile, operating an automobile in the story. And it's a simple, I, I went paragraph by paragraph trying to decide how much should I include, how many details, whether I should be quick or be more specific for that particular part of the story. And again, you can review it by yourself, especially now that your, your memory is fresh with my presentation of the story. You can appreciate uh, what I did uh, and have an idea of the level of relevance. Again, in this case, 640 words is probably overkill. I might have left a few just a few details, but it's also the nature of this particular story. In fact, what I did last year was also tell students that although the recommended number of short stories for the project is three, if you find a story that is particularly intricate or rich in details, you can easily get permission to go down 
to two. It would be nice if you submitted this uh, request to me so that you don't have any surprises, so that you get confirmation from me that the story is in fact so rich that <coughs> you would need more than a thousand words to include or include everything in, in the matrix in this uh, template. Okay. And when you read this section, you should be able to see how my presentation of the summary is not entirely descriptive, that there are elements of subtle commentary and analysis within my summary. The next section, relevant quotes, appears to be easy, but in fact, there is an art to this. And the first thing is, how much, how long a quote should I include? And the ideal parameters are the following, that each one of the quotes or short passages that you include should be clear to anyone who has not read the story and should be providing evidence of the relevance of the representation of the automobile in this short story. That is to say, when I read a passage, there should be enough of a context that the passage itself is clear that it's clear why I included it, right? For example, look at the first one. At last we can live, I have bought an automobile. Even if I don't know anything about the story, I haven't read it, I haven't read the summary, I understand that there is an association of value between the purchase of the automobile and a full life, right? And immediately I find this significant right? Even without additional information provided. There are other passages where this theme, this association is suggested, but in order to get from the passage to the understanding of the theme, I need an analysis. If that's the case, don't include the passage here. Include it in the summary, in the synopsis, or the analysis. Anything that goes in here should be such that I read it and I immediately understand why you included it, why it is significant. Being of a mechanical turn of mind, I was able to demonstrate for myself in a few moments the absolute invulnerability of the road run. Everything here speaks positively of the car. It speaks of the internalization of the transformation of becoming the owner of a car, right? So even without an explanation, I find it valuable. It advances my understanding of the general topic. And this, I did this kind of filter I applied to extract these passages. Again, I could have done with fewer make sure once you've made your selection to look at it from the angle of someone who has not read the story and for whom this fragment contains enough clear information, enough language to make it interesting for the themes. Okay, and as you can see, I included 390 words Part of that is the consequence of how interesting the whole story is, but I, I could have done without so many passages. For the analysis, I didn't write as much because as I said, my synopsis already includes some of the key elements of the story in here, for this particular story, which is, may not be the case for other stories, what I focused on was the narrative arc of the story. 
trying to find the matching points between this story and the pattern that I introduced both in the class wiki and in my class discussions for many of the narratives on technology that goes from anticipation of the technology before I have the car in my hands, fascination, seduction, when I receive the technology, when I experience, interact with the technology, rapture, right? At some point in the language, we find that Mr. Von Blumer was hypnotized by the car and the car was there not working at all. And yet he he's stroking the car, looking at, at, at it with this trance-like gaze. Uh, so fascination, seduction, rapture, loss of control is what we often found in narratives. And that is true because of the accident or potential accident involving the characters at the end when they lose power and they start going downhill. They're going on a steep climb. They lose power. The brakes are not sufficient to stop the car because brakes were terrible on the early cars, actually on most cars until the 1940s. Um, so they're at the mercy of the technology. And finally, separation from the technology. Because after they get off the car, they both publicly state, both the wife and the husband, that they want nothing to do with the car any longer. And this pattern is perfectly developed and executed in this short story. In other stories, there might be a partial inclusion of elements. Or if this is not at all relevant for the story you're analyzing, you might want to focus the analysis on a specific passage, on a specific episode, on the language inside a dialogue about the automobile. Be in charge of... So this, this template should support your work, but it's not a cage. So make sure you take charge and develop ideas to include in each section that are appropriate for the story. And in fact, when you decide to include a story, think of this matrix and how the story would work. How comfortable will I be working with this story? Do I find enough? Is it easy to extract quotes? Is it easy to include some analysis? Can I do a summary that shows my understanding of the relevant, essential elements in the story. And if that's not the case, because the story is kind of simple, kind of weak, kind of lame, then move on and try to, um, to find another story. In past classes, I required that the three stories included in the project be unique and original found by the students. In fact, it takes time to find not any story about the automobile in these magazines, but good stories. So this year, I will allow you to borrow some of the stories, one or two, from a list. Already you have three examples. The first one is off limits because it's done, but you can use example number two or number three if you like them in your project, and I, pro I will provide another four or five. So the minimum requirement this time, this semester, would be that at least one of the three stories in the project be a story that you have found yourself in the magazines whose links you find on this page, okay? And I'll be there to provide help, meaning if you find a story, you think it's a good story for the project, but you're not completely sure or confident that it will work, you can send me the link and I can look at it. Maybe I know the story already. Maybe I haven't seen it yet and I'll be happy to read it. And then I can tell you it's a great story. Go ahead. Or it's a story that you can work with. 
if you think you can extract enough relevant information, or I can tell you, it's a story about the automobile, but it's only marginally relevant for a project like this, because the references to the automobile are superficial, right? And this may happen also. Your presentation at the end of the semester should be based on one of those stories. Don't feel compelled to present all three of the stories. First of all, by the time you do the presentation, you may not have finished the project. But also because you want to present one of these stories in depth, where you put on the screen the story, you read a passage that is significant, and then you analyze it in front of me. Okay, and we'll talk about the presentation uh, during the next few weeks, of course. Just to recap the key details of the presentation, the recommended format is to schedule a Zoom meeting with me, and, and there, are, there is a specific link that you find in the calendar for that. During the last week of the semester uh, or uh, the beginning of finals week, the alternative would be if, if this is not convenient for you to record a video of your presentation and share it with me. Allow me to download the video. Okay, so that is what I wanted to show you. Again, I've added my comments now, but the important thing is for you, as soon as you have a chance to review the example, so that it may help you understand how the project should be executed. And it's five sections of different length, but also offers you an opportunity, if you're so inclined, not to wait until the very end, until the night of the deadline to complete this project, but start from something, let's say, the bibliographical <laughs> references, the relevant quotes, if they seem more approachable, or start summarizing the beginning of the story. And again, at any point in time, since your project eventually should be placed in the same file, Google Docs, where you have your assignments, you can also put there a comment saying, Professor, can you please review my summary of the story and tell me if it's done well, right? Provided you have time to work on this ahead of the deadline. Let me switch to to the page for the film. I'll introduce the film briefly and then we'll watch part of it, a few scenes. First Auto, 1927, is technically a hybrid film, a film with a synchronized soundtrack, but the amount of sound included in the film is limited because, as I said, in 1927, not all theaters were equipped with sound systems. was directed by Roydal Ruth, who incidentally had trained, worked as an assistant with Max Sennett, who was the director of the last silent film we watched, Barney Oldfield saves a life with a woman tied, chained to the railroad tracks. And Roy De Ruth was active in Hollywood in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. The 1940s was the apex of his career when he was one of the highest paid directors. He died in, in the early 1960s short after his retirement from the profession. In, even though the title is the first auto, it is not about the invention of the automobile. 
the film is about two things. The general theme is the transition of American society from horses to automobiles and the representation of this transition happens, is externalized, is made visual, formatted as a story that can be can become a film by placing the effects of this transition within the story of a family. So the two main themes of the film that you should keep in mind while you're watching the film and thinking about smart comments on it are the positive or negative representation or ambiguous representation of the technology and family values. A lot of films produced in Hollywood during the, the late 1920s and the 1930s are about family values. In this case, harmony in the family is the chief value, social and personal value that drives the narrative and constitutes the moral message, the educational content of the film. At the beginning of the film, you find the two protagonists, the father and the son. The father, Hank Armstrong, whom you see here, is a jockey. He races horses. In the American Midwest, uh, the, the, the town of this family is Maple City. It's not clear whether it's fictional or it's actually a town in Michigan, probably the latter. So, race after race, he's a winner thanks to the uh, strength of his favorite or horse, a female horse called Slow Eyes, where slow is S-L-O-E, not W. S-L-O-E, it, it's a kind of berry uh, similar to a blueberry. Um, and the father is a local hero celebrated in town because of his victories. The time at the beginning of the movie is around 1895. Give or take a year. At the end of the movie, there is an epilogue that takes us in the 1920s, but most of the story takes place between 1895 or 96 and 1904. So the father clearly represents the older America that not only relies on horses for work and transportation, but also has this attachment to past practices involving the horse. In this case, there is a strong attachment. And from a moralistic point of view, what is the sin of this father? It's a sin of pride. He relishes in his victories and probably from what we see, loves his horse more than his son. This is the part of the film that we will not be able to see because I want to focus on the most relevant parts. Right after one of the victories on the racetrack at the beginning of the film, a slimy guy that you see here, of course, you have to be able to read on the faces of the characters whether they're good or bad. It's, it is still, after all, largely a silent film. You still find the intertitles, those slides with text, that make you either understand some key lines or place a scene without the temporal development of the film. This slimy guy goes to Hank Armstrong to his stables saying, I want to buy your horse because it's a winning horse. And Hank will say, no, I will never sell it. I'd rather cut my arm or my leg before I sell slow eyes. Now, when we see the other lead character, Hank's son, whose name is Bob, Bob Armstrong, we find Bob together with Rose, who will eventually become his partner, in an ice cream parlor. 
and to make us understand that Bob's dream is to build a car. He is making a car out of cookies to exemplify his engineering skills and talking about his future, of course. If indeed the movie takes place in Michigan, you can understand how later on Bob will move to Detroit, which wouldn't be too far, uh, to work with Henry Ford. While Rose and Bob are in the ice cream parlor talking and exchanging romantic eyes, uh, looking at each other romantically, Hank, the father, comes in. He's giving out cigars to the people in the ice cream parlors because he wants everybody to be happy and to celebrate his recent victory. But he talks to his son, Bob, and he tells him, I didn't see you at the race. So we know that there is a first element of contrast. Bob was not there to see his father win a race at the racetrack in their own hometown of Maple City. This contrast, this division, grows even wider when a little later, one night, the prized female horse of Hank, Slow Eyes, dies giving birth to Bright Eyes, another female horse. Actually, uh, the, the mother horse has a stroke. Hank calls the doctor, and you know what happens. The doctor, in order to get to the stables, can only rely on a traditional small carriage. There is a lot of rain that night. The roads are muddy. The buggy, the carriage of the doctor is slow. So by the time he gets there, it's too late to save the horse. While this is happening, this tragic scene in the stables, once again, Hank asks about his son. Is my son here? No, Bob is not there. Bob is asleep. Hank goes to Bob's bedroom and says, Son, my horse, which I loved clearly, has died. And Bob says, Oh, too bad, Dad. Good night, and goes back to sleep. So we find this is Hank's hand on a portrait of his old horse, Slow Eyes, caressing the portrait of the horse while the sun is asleep. So we know that there is a growing divide between these two characters. Things don't go any better with the progression of time. Even though Hank remains victorious in his racing career, there is something else to take the attention of the people of Maple City from their local jockey. An inventor, the inventor of the automobile, comes to town to showcase, to talk about automobiles, and this is where we will start watching the scene. And we will see that Bob is helping the inventor with his presentation. They're using a uh, rudimentary projector to project images of carriages and automobiles on the screen. Following this, uh, we'll look at scenes such as the townsfolk gathering to witness the first automobile ride by the first owner in town, a rich, vain person by the name of Stebbings, I think. And this automobile ride doesn't go well. Again, you have loss of control. You have the distraction of the car. And Hank feels left out because everyone, everybody's attention is captured by the automobile, but he's somewhat, um, he is glad that this ride didn't go well. And, and 
he may continue to believe that horses have a better future than automobiles. His son will go work in a mechanic's shop. Year after year, Hank will lose more of his business because there are fewer people buying horses, selling horses. Hank will move to Detroit to work with Barney Oldfield and Harry Ford. The film includes a, an antique for the, for the 1920s when the movie was shot. The Ford 999 used for a speed land record by Henry Ford. We see it in some of the scenes. And by the time uh, Bob, the son, returns home, hoping to reconnect to his father, his father has lost everything, including bright eyes, the, the horse birthed by uh, slow eyes, the, the champion, the winning horse. And his father is so bitter and so angry at the technology of the automobile that his father agrees to sabotage a race car before a, a race that will take place in the local racetrack. Only at the last moment, Hank, the father, will learn that the car he has sabotaged will be driven by his son, Bob, who wants to surprise the father, showing that he himself can be victorious with automobiles where his father was a winner using horses. How can Hank, the father, save his son? He only has, once again, a carriage pulled by bright eyes that has come back, the horse that has come back to his old, old owner, and horses are not quick enough. By the time Hank reaches the racetrack, an accident has happened. Bob gets out of the car, stumbles, falls to the ground, appears to be dead, and then is taken to the hospital. Hank, the father, struck by grief, feeling guilty, thinking he has killed his own son, goes to the stables, burns the stables, the stables are empty at this point, and when he's coming out of this building that is on fire, he finds Rose, who is now Bob's fiance, who tells him, Bob is fine, he wants to see you at the hospital, takes him there with the car, and the conclusion of the film shows that where once the stables with Hank's horses were built in, in the town, now there is an automobile factory run by Bob with his father. They're both rich and successful. Bob is still racing cars. And already society is thinking about the newest, the latest technology having to do with speed, airplanes.